Yes, madam. Yes. Okay. Are we online? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Well, we welcome all for the webinar series on infection control measures in the new normal era of respiratory practice. At the outset, I wish to thank the organizers for giving us an opportunity to be part of this seminar. When we were approached for this uh, guest lectures, we felt that infection control will be ideal and apt for this COVID era because it is very saddening to note at least 3 to 10% of all the healthcare workers contract COVID infection. Then the global statistics, if you take the global statistics, 5.6 million cases are there with more than 90,000 deaths. And in taking India, new cases are there. Yesterday, 23rd, it is 83,347 new cases are there in yesterday. As far as Tamil Nadu is concerned, there is 53,000 people are suffering from COVID. So there are so many guidelines for infection control practices in COVID. There are national guidelines, international guidelines, regional guidelines, even hospital guidelines, hospital policies. Even our Ministry of Health has given guidelines for COVID infection control practices. So whatever is the guidelines, we have four eminent speakers who can be talking you on pulmonary practices, then how to go about in ICU care, when you do PFT, then when you do nebulization. Even though in COVID era, because of the aerosol generating procedures, we are not we are not doing the procedures. Slowly we are starting to come to the near normal area, and it is high time we try starting all these practices. So I think we will start the webinar series without wasting much time. Our first speaker will be Dr. Suganya. She will be speaking on infection control practices in pulmonary pulmonary area. Dr. Suganya is an eminent speaker, actually. She has got 15 years of experience in clinical microbiology, infection prevention and control. She has got certifications from USA, University of South Wales, Australia, and also from Amrita Institute in Kochi. She is a certified internal auditor for NABL and also for NABH. She is a certified assessor for NABH. At present, she is a consultant and trainer at CARE Institute of Health Sciences, Hyderabad, for infection pre prevention and control certification courses. Over to you, Suvanya. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me. Uh, first of all, good morning to all of you. And at the outset, I would really like to thank uh, IARC as well as Dr. Meenakshi and her team at Chetinad for giving me this opportunity to actually interact with all of you all and to enrich and enhance our knowledge on IPC practices in pulmonology medicine. Right. So without much ado, let me first, uh, you know, actually look at how exactly, uh, why are we actually talking about this topic of infection prevention and control uh, in specifically respiratory medicine. So as we all know, we are in the midst of a pandemic of COVID-19 and COVID-19 basically is a respiratory pathogen. Uh, if you look at uh, the, you know, the, uh, the profile of healthcare workers uh, currently, all of us are healthcare workers, whether, whether we are doctors, nurses, whether we are respiratory therapists, right? Whether we are technicians in the lab, all of us are healthcare workers who are at an increased risk for acquiring infections, any infection for that matter, not only respiratory, any infection, purely as, as a result of doing our jobs. So this becomes more of an occupational hazard for all of us. And in the middle of this pandemic, I think we need to take, uh, you know, be more careful and take adequate and appropriate precautions by following specific and appropriate infection prevention control practices. Now, if you look at the previous outbreaks or epidemics and pandemics uh, of viral respiratory pathogens, around uh, healthcare workers have actually contributed to 20% of cases in the SARS outbreak and 18% of cases in the MERS outbreak. And up till now, greater than 65,000 uh, healthcare workers have actually been infected due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
right so this is a very uh, you know it's a very dangerous figure and the, the the number of cases in fact is increasing day by day so we need to understand where are we uh, failing to actually uh, as dr meenakshi said we have you know actually stopped in if you look at your pulmonary medicine your practices you know certain specific procedures with uh, which are aerosol generating uh, procedures have actually been stopped and there is no progress in actually attending to these uh, issues right so instead of uh, uh, you know putting an absolute cessation to these procedures or practices in respiratory medicine we need to retrospectively think and prospectively put forward what specific precautions we need to take take uh, or we need to adapt in order to continue with our practice of pulmonary medicine so the major uh, you know factors which have actually contributed to the increased number of infections among among healthcare workers have been due to lapses in infection control practices right the basic uh, you know the most important uh, uh, features are not having the appropriate type of personal protective equipment or the number of pp for example the number of particulate respirators or um, n95 respirators right then lack of having uh, you know isolation facilities for infectious patients okay then lack of awareness of risk factors epidemiological risk factors such as uh, you know not being aware of contact history not being aware of the socio economic status of the Uh, the people or the patients whom you are caring for right or, or not having a uh, you know taking a proper history of travel okay or recent travel or recent contact with pets or uh, you know infected animals this is again a very important part when we talk about practice in respiratory medicine and initially whenever there is a pandemic with a with a new respiratory pathogen there is a gap in the awareness and the understanding of the pathogen how does it get transmitted what are the, what are the different routes of transmission is it only airborne is it droplet is it also contact right there is a big gap initial in, at the initial phases and this is still a gap in in the in the, when you talk about covid 19 this there is there are still lot of uh, gray zones uh, when you talk about the modes of transmission right so therefore uh, taking all these factors into play the traditional application of standard precautions alone in uh, such a pandemic or in any epidemic or, or outbreak situation will not be enough right so coming to the principles and strategies what are the core principles and strategies uh, for infection prevention and control especially uh, with regards to acute respiratory illnesses let's just go through it rapidly the first is of course as you all know when a, when a patient comes into your opd or, or emergency department is the early and the rapid recognition and source control you identify the patient with acute respiratory or febrile illness okay and control or basically that person is the source and then you control the source that's the first thing the second is standard precautions so standard precautions i think all of us are aware as um, you know doctors as uh, nurses or as technicians you will be aware of basic concepts of standard precautions like hand hygiene uh, you know personal protective equipment donning doffing right all these will be definitely implemented it has to be implemented for all patients along with additional precautions which are also called as transmission based precautions right based on the roots of uh, transmission of that particular viral uh, respiratory pathogen or any other respiratory pathogen we will have to implement additional transmission based precautions okay right and then you again have the most important uh, you know feature which has gained a lot of importance nowadays in terms of covid is the personal protective equipment and the use of respirators okay you also have environmental and engineering controls which play a major role in prevention of transmission of pathogens and administrative controls such as triaging cohorting how do you place patients in a bed in a multi bed in a single bed and infrastructure for ipc all these come under the principles and strategies for infection prevention and control for acute respiratory illnesses now coming to early recognition as i told you the first thing is when a patient comes into your pulmonary medicine opd if you are a technician or a therapist or even a nurse or a doctor the first is to rapidly recognize and identify what whether the patient requires an isolation or not right so these are some of the uh, you know symptoms and signs i'm not going to go these are they're very common symptoms and signs but what we really need to look for as pointers or uh, you know signs and clinical symptoms of uh, to be alerted upon are unusual symptoms and unusual number of patients coming with such unusual symptoms and also coming together as a cluster occurring at the same time right this will indicate a sort of a clustering of cases or an outbreak or epidemic or on a global scale even a pandemic situation okay some of the unusual symptoms of such acute respiratory diseases would be 
vomiting in children, okay, even uh, shortness of breath, hypoxia, even sometimes they present with cardiovascular uh, symptoms, okay. So these are some things which are pointers for us to recognize early and identify that these patients should be given appropriate isolation precautions, right? Right. Now coming to source control. Now you have identified the patient in your in your OPD or ER emergency department. You have to identify. So basically, sources of these respiratory illnesses could be healthcare workers. They could be infected, symptomatic patients who are admitted in your ward or your isolation ward or your ICU. Okay, and they could also be people who are coming in uh, along with the patient who are totally asymptomatic. Right, and they could also be carriers of respiratory pathogens. So these are all uh, clues for you to identify that these are the sources and to recognize them and immediately, right? So in order to do a control of these sources, we need to understand or to in order to prevent transmission of infections from these sources or recognized patients, we need to understand what are the different routes of transmission of viral respiratory pathogens. Okay, so if you look at it, I've put it in this slide, right? You have an infected individual. There are three or four, basically three major routes of transmission. One is what you call as airborne route or aerosol. They are also called as droplet nuclei. Okay, these particles which are usually generated when a patient coughs, sneezes, right? Or sometimes even talks loudly, right? Okay, are very small, uh, uh, you know, particles less than five microns in size, and therefore they're very light. They remain suspended in the air along with the dust, and they get dispersed to long, to larger, long distances, and remain suspended for a larger number, an amount of time. Okay, so these airborne aerosols can be especially infectious, and therefore here basically we need to understand about the ventilation and the environmental controls to address this issue. The other important thing is the mode of transmission, as the droplet method of or mode of transmission or the route of transmission. Now droplets are slightly heavier particles, okay, which are greater than five microns, which do not travel for a distance of greater than one meter. They are so usually within one meter of the patient. And these droplets can directly, you know, impinge upon a person who is within one meter of the patient directly. These droplets can, uh, you know, get onto the conjunctival mucosa, onto the buccal mucosa, onto the nasal mucosa, okay, which is exposed in the healthcare worker and cause infection, or the droplets can definitely, again, contaminate the hands of the patients or hands of the healthcare workers. They can be, they can contaminate the environment around the patient, okay? So these are direct contact when it, when there is a contamination of the hands and indirect contact when there is contamination of the uh, inanimate objects, which we, which we normally call as, call as fomites, okay? Th they could be bed rails, they could be ventilator panels, they could be a side table, Right, so many uh, inanimate objects are around the patient in a bed, right? So all these can also get contaminated with these droplets. And again, indirectly, the healthcare worker or any susceptible individual, it can be even a patient's attendant or a visitor who comes to see the patient can get uh, uh, infected through the indirect route. Okay, so these are the different uh, methods of transmission, okay, uh, of respiratory pathogens. And on an average, why we are talking, why we are giving more importance to the direct and indirect contact is because on an average, if you look at, uh, you know, any human being, they, you know, touch their face up to 20 times an hour without your knowledge, right? And most, about 44% of these uh, touching on the face, right, involve eyes, okay, mouth and nose. And these are very easy entry points for any viral pathogen to enter. So it's very imperative here to remember that here hand hygiene and here environmental decontamination surface disinfection plays an extremely important role in preventing the, uh, you know, transmission of pathogens. Right. So let's now talk about source. That's about the general, uh, you know, uh, transmission dynamics of any viral or even respiratory pathogen. Now, when you talk about the OPD and the ER, right? You're working as a therapist, you're working as a nurse in the emergency department, in the outpatient department, right? You get a patient. So what are the immediate steps you would implement in order to prevent transmission of infection to you as well as to other patients surrounding you in the OPD or ER? So this is called source control, okay? The first step, as I already told you, is early recognition and investigation. So basically, you need to place visual alerts, when in your OPDs and emergency departments, okay, to remind patients so that to, the staff is informed about symptoms such as fever, respiratory, uh, you know, symptoms like coughing, sneezing. Patients are aware that if they have these specific set of symptoms, they need to inform the 
front desk. They need to go to a different location. So that information has to be very clearly displayed at the entrances of your OPD and the emergency uh, room. Okay. The, also at the emergency room or at the OPD registration desk, there should be information collected by the person who's doing the registration, okay, such as fever history, travel history, contact history with any other communicable diseases, all these, there should be a preliminary, uh, uh, you know, history taking of the risk factors for pandemic influenza or any sort of res viral respiratory agent. So this is something which we really need to look out for. Okay, they should also be able to assess whether that particular patient requires any additional precautions. Like suppose you, you find that a child is excessively coughing, right? And you find that the, the uh, next to the child, there is a senior citizen who's sitting, right? So you need to identify that this child could be a potential source for infection, right? And you need to uh, tell the patient to wear a mask. You can provide a mask, provide hand rub, provide disposable tissues. Okay, so this is something which we need to do. So this is called promotion of respiratory hygiene and distancing of patients. So such patients who present with such ILI, ILI like influenza-like illnesses and any respiratory symptoms should be isolated or cohorted. Cohorted means placing all the patients with similar respiratory symptoms or laboratory confirmed diagnosis in, together in one place and away from the other people, right? That is, that's the meaning of social distancing and cohorting, right? So additional to your uh, putting the mask on the patient and giving them, um, you know, disposable tissues, you should also implement other standard precautions like wearing of gloves while taking uh, caring for the patient or taking the patient's file. Okay, you should also be able to report and uh, improve the surveillance of how many cases of such ILI, ILI uh, patients have you seen today in your OPD. So that why are we doing reporting and surveillance as therapists or as technicians or even as doctors, we may feel that's not my job, but it is very important because unless you give account of, there are so many, we saw today around 10 patients coming in with similar symptoms like this. Okay, so there's something wrong. So we need to improve uh, our infection prevention and control uh, practices in this specific area. So that is the importance of reporting and surveillance and also notification to public health authorities. And of course, the most important as doctors is to, treat such patients as soon as possible so as to make them or render them non-infectious, right? Now, this is again um, an example. This diagram is beautifully explained. It's an example of uh, triaging, okay? What, what do you mean of triaging? So when you get a person, when you get a patient with maybe respiratory pathogens unknown, okay? The patient basically is, we could be a walk-in patient or could come in an ambulance if he's hypoxic or has severe symptoms. And such patients should be basically as I already told you, the front desk will take a, a history of the uh, clinical history, travel history, etc. Identify such suspicious patients and send them to the uh, doctor for clinical examination. Okay. Now, those who do not have such, uh, you know, clinical or, or epidemiological clues towards uh, respiratory pathogen, will obviously you will obviously place them in a separate room away from this room, at least two at least two meters away from this. And this specific room should have a separate ventilation from this other triaging room or a waiting area, okay? So once the doctor examines the patient, okay, both clinically as well as through lab, as well as radiological guidelines, what will happen? Okay, if the patient is suspected to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, infective uh, uh, respiratory pathogen of infective etiology, extreme infections, okay, then, that particular uh, patient will be diverted to an isolation area. And the other patients, okay, suppose a patient just presents with bacterial pharyngitis or bacterial laryngitis, which is not so contagious. The, yes, you require standard precautions or contract precautions. Those will again be, those type of patients will be routed through a different route. So this is an example of a triage setup at the OPD and the ER, which can be implemented. It's a very basic design, which is given by the WHO. Right. Now the patient is entered into your OPD, right? So how do you see the patient? How do you examine the patient as doctors? So there are the most important thing in most of our setups is that we do not have uh, very good uh, ventilation systems which are inbuilt in our OPDs, right? I think we all agree with that. We cannot blame uh, anybody for that because it, it's a part, it's, it's a universal phenomenon across all setups, whether you're working in a government, private, or whether you're working in a corporate, this is the setup everywhere. So how do we prevent ourselves from getting infected? Suppose you're doing a therapy, you're doing a chest physio for a patient, or you're examining the patient, or you're uh, you know, actually clinically uh, looking at the patient, examining, auscultating. So where should the doctor or the healthcare worker be seated? So in this particular diagram B, the healthcare worker 
is seated here and there is a window which is to the right of the healthcare worker okay and the window is opposite to the entrance which facilitates a good ventilation a cross ventilation system and the patient placement should be on the right side or in front of the doctor so that the, any aerosols or droplets which are transmitted will directly be carried through the window and outside and there's very little chance for contamination or cross transmission of these pathogens to the doctor versus this diagram when the patient or when the doctor is sitting just you know in front of the window where all the respiratory aerosols and droplets have to go past the uh, you know doctor or the healthcare worker and out into the window so this is not a good arrangement and this is a good arrangement so by at least changing the seating arrangement of how you actually uh, sit in the opd and examine your patients simple things like this can actually prevent transmission of infections in healthcare right so this is again when you are telling that okay this patient can be quarantined at home okay you really don't require to admit a patient we don't have beds so what are the important things which you will uh, advise to the patient and their family members so please remember in any pandemic or epidemic situation especially when you're talking about respiratory pathogens okay education and awareness of basic precautions basic ipc standards and protocols is essential for the patients attendants and the visitors okay so you have to ensure that the key, the patients in the home in the house are apart from other members they are kept in a separate room with a good cross ventilation okay we having a separate rest room right so these and they should be adequate they should be a hand rub in the room all these is very important in a at home dr sudhir sorry to interrupt ma'am you got five more minutes sudhir yeah okay ma'am so this is a, again a, a diagram which shows that within uh, you know in the in the ward how do you actually uh, uh, keep the patient so if you are working within 1 meter you will obviously need to wear personal protective equipment otherwise you can you need not really wear any other ppe okay this is again a way of in which you can prevent transmission by use of disposable tissues and respiratory hygiene in the wards in patient rooms now this is an example of a single uh, bed uh, bed ward okay the the way in which the air flow should be could be is it should always be either from the front of the uh, uh, or the opening or the entrance of the uh, ward or the room and exhausted towards the or behind the patient's head similarly in the b diagram also if you look at it air inflow is from the top and exhaust exhaustion is or exhaust of the air is behind the patient's head so this is again another way this is again in a multi bed ward okay for lack of time I'll, i can share these slides this is with natural ventilation with open windows without ac and this is a diagram which shows the multi bed ward with ac how the air flow should be and how the exhaust should be okay we talked about cohorting this is an example of cohorting placing all well patients together and all ill patients or respiratory ili ili like uh, you know symptom patients in one particular area right this is an example of an airborne isolation room specifically airborne isolation rooms are for use for tb measles chickenpox and of course sars cov2 and any novel acute respiratory infections which you really don't know how the modes of transmission are it is always better to place them in a negative airborne isolation room the air inside pressure inside this room is at a negative pressure so that any aerosols or droplets or uh, infectious aerosols which are released are contained within this room and exhausted out through a hepa filter and out into the atmosphere right so talking about environmental controls as i already told you ventilation plays a very important role right so ventilation can be natural ventilation by means of open windows or you can have Uh, mechanical ventilations by use of exhaust fans or you can have a mixed mode ventilation of both natural as well as uh, you know mechanical ventilation but if you are using a mixed mode ventilation you should have some amount if there is any recirculation of air which is happening in the room then the the air which is recirculated should be cleaned or disinfected using either uvgi or using any portable air cleaner if the room is small you cannot use portable air cleaners if the room is very big right these are uh, these are the uh, very imperative engineering controls which are required that is the number of air changes per hour which is mandated at different areas of the hospital okay so we have uh, if you look at this most of the areas in the hospital you 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 can suffice with six air changes per hour but in high risk settings like such as a tb uh, chest uh, pulmonary opd or a tb opd or in bronchoscopy okay you should have 
uh, comparatively higher air, air exchanges, uh, air changes per hour, at least 12 and above should be the air changes per hour. And if you don't have uh, air changes per hour, that is, you cannot measure ACH, then natural ventilation should be controlled. And these are some of the important criteria by which you can achieve the same ACH or the same amount of ventilation, even if you don't or you cannot measure the number of air changes per hour. Okay, I talked to you about portable air cleaners. So portable air cleaners, you, if you see, if you look at the commercials, there are a number of air cleaners. You have HEPA filtered air cleaners. These are the ones which are very important. You should, you should, uh, it is imperative for you to check whether they are really containing truly HEPA filters, which are efficiency of 99.97, okay? And these filters can only be used when natural ventilation is not possible. So please remember. Okay, by itself, the by placing a HEPA filter, a portable HEPA filter, you cannot prevent transmission of COVID-19 or other any other novel respiratory viruses. Okay, HEPA filter, portable air cleaners should be along with, uh, you know, a good ventilation system and along with source control. Only then they will work in preventing transmission of pathogens. I will not go through the slide because of the lack of time, okay, but there is an EOSH uh, guideline for using uh, portable HEPAs, okay. How do you effectively use a portable HEPA when you cannot provide adequate, uh, you know, engineering controls in a particular room? This is a diagram. I will leave it for you all to ponder about. I have marked specifically how it has to be kept, how it has to be placed, and you can actually keep two patients in one room and use a portable HEPA air cleaner. Right. Then again, coming to UVGI for decontamination of rooms award. Again, this can be done. Okay, these are examples of wall-mounted uh, fixtures with horizontal levers, or you can have ceiling-mounted uh, UVGI fixtures. Okay, all of these have got levers in order to prevent or confine the radiation uh, emission of UVGI to a horizontal band. The UV light which is used for this is UVC, which has got, which will have a bactericidal and a virucidal uh, irradiation spectrum. Okay, these are some of the criteria for placement of UVGI and some of the safety considerations when you place a UVGI. UVGI is not the best resort, but in extremely, you know, crowded places, only in very high risk settings, when you don't have and you cannot provide adequate ventilation, you can use this as an alternative. Okay, now coming to standard precautions, that's my favorite topic. Okay, of course, we have a lot of things in standard precautions from hand hygiene, wearing of PPE, Okay, decontamination of patient care equipment, addressing blood spills, cleanly, cleanliness of the environment, prevention of sharps, okay, handling of waste as well as linen and laundry and even utensils. All these factors, when we address, okay, can break the uh, chain of infection and prevent transmission of pathogens. Okay, I will not go in detail about hand hygiene. I think every time you have an infection prevention and control class, you will be talking about hand hygiene. I want you to remember what are the five moments of hand hygiene, which are defined by WHO. And a very important thing to remember is if your hands are visibly soiled with sputum or secretions, please do not use alcohol hand rub, wash with running water and soap. Okay, so never use alcohol hand rub if your hands are visibly soiled. Otherwise, you can use in other situations, you can use alcohol hand rub. Okay, so these are the techniques. I will not go through it uh, in detail again. The important thing is if you're using an alcohol hand rub, use adequate amount of the alcohol and at least keep it on your hand and rub it in the correct technique for you know, 20 to 30 seconds. And if it's a soap and water which, uh, wash which you're doing, it should be done at least for a minimum of a minute. Right now, the principles when you're we are talking about personal protective equipment, there are numerous personal protective equipment which all of us are using uh, in the healthcare. The important principles which you need to consider when you're using any PPE, whether it's just a mask or it's just a glove, is you have to choose the PPE as per the risk. Don't wear everything like a space astronaut and you know perform activities. It's very difficult to perform. Choose as per what type of care you're going to give for the patient. Okay, that is the PPE which you'll choose. Avoid contamination, especially when you're removing or doffing of the PPE. Okay, this happens very commonly. Discard whatever PPE you are using appropriately as per the hospital policy and do not share PPE. Don't say this brown is fine. You know, I've just used it once and there's nothing you can please use it. Don't, you're not saving cost for anybody, right? And please change personal protective equipment completely and please perform hand hygiene means wash with soap and water once you remove your personal protective equipment. Again, this is a slide by which, what is the sequence in which you can don the PPE? What is the sequence in which you have to doff or take out the PPE? I will keep it. Okay, the most important thing which you need to remember is when you need to put on, you have to wash your hands before you put on any PPE and you have to put on the gloves in the as the last step. 
when you're doffing, when you're removing, removal of gloves becomes the first step. Okay, this is in short, the major points for donning and doffing. Okay, and when you're talking about aerosol generating procedures, I won't go through what are all the aerosol generating procedures as respiratory uh, medicine people, you will be knowing a lot of these things, even collection of sputum and throat swab is considered as a aerosol generating procedure in the lab. So for these aerosol generating procedures, the, it is mandated to wear an N95 uh, particulate respirator. Okay, again, training on the donning of a respiratory particulate uh, of a uh, N95 respirator and checking the fit of a respirator is extremely important. Otherwise, it is equivalent to not wearing any mask at all, right? Again, now there is because of the shortage of N95 mask, there is a reuse policy in many of the places. So this is a specific way in which you have to take out the respirator without contaminating it. Okay, and also how do you store it? CDC has a five day reuse strategy for uh, N95 masks, which says that each healthcare worker can be given five N95 masks. Ma'am? Yeah, you can take five more minutes. Huh? Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So, okay. yes, ma'am. So, uh, this is the CDC five day reuse strategy. You can go through it. Each healthcare worker will be given five days and they can reuse it uh, after fifth day. So, today I'm wearing N95 mask. I will remove, store in a uh, Ziploc airtight, uh, uh, you know, envelope with my name, label with, with my name and the date. Tomorrow I will wear a new one. And the first one I will take on the sixth day again to reuse. So, this is called the five day reuse strategy of CDC, not recommended to reuse any PPE, but in, in times when your management says that I cannot issue so much of so many respirators for you, rather than being without anything, you can adapt this five day reuse strategy. Talking about respiratory hygiene and etiquette, I think all of you know of this. This is a very uh, good poster by the CDC by which, which you can actually post and keep in your OPDs and entrances, which will help in uh, prevention of transmission of pathogens. Okay, coming to environmental decontamination, surface disinfection, very important if you're doing a chest physio, if you're collecting a sputum, whatever you are doing with a patient with a respiratory illness, it is important to have a good protocol for surface disinfection with a good hospital approved disinfectant. Okay, it's very important because some of the disinfectants, some groups of disinfectants may not be effective against certain pathogens. So you need to address, suppose you're working in a TB clinic, you need to understand what disinfectant you're using. Is it actually tuberculosidal, right? So this is again a table wherein the frequency of cleaning of each of the areas is given and additional guidance is given for how to clean, right? Then again, Equipment disinfection. So equipment disinfection, there are many things which we reuse for patients. It's not that everybody uses single-use disposable uh, items. So again, there should be a protocol, how it should be cleaned, with what it should be cleaned, etc. And laundry and linen also of the, when you're using, suppose you're going giving a chest physiotherapy, uh, you know, in the, in the ward or in the thing, the, and there is a, a spillage of uh, secretions or whatever it is, okay, there is a method of collecting the uh, linen without agitation and manipulation, uh, you know, labeling it as with a biohazard label and treating it with a hot wash cycle. So all these are extremely important in prevention of contamination of the surroundings of the patient and in preventing uh, you know, transmission to yourself when you're dealing with or giving care to the patients. Again, cleaning of environment, when we tell the housekeeping, please come here, yeah, clean this uh, room, you know, clean the patient bed, I have to transfer another patient. It's very important for you that you ask the supervisor of the house, housekeeping uh, department to supervise how the cleaning is done. Okay, there are some uh, places, there are many uh, places in a, in a uh, patient room, which are called as uh, high touch points, which need to be des definitely disinfected and cleaned and also so in, a, in the restroom of the patient, okay? So this is again very important. Uh, another uh, important aspect which we normally forget is pre-hospital care and transport to other hospitals. Suppose you cannot take care of a patient in your ER, how, when you transfer a patient to another hospital, what, what are the important things you need to do? Okay, you need to screen first the patient, whether you have to identify whether this patient is a, uh, is a patient with pandemic influenza or an or influenza of a different strain, right? You need to put uh, you know, you need to put a mask, you need to wear appropriate PP, you need to guide the ambulance people as to what additional transmission based precautions they need to take, avoid any aerosol generating procedures inside the ambulance, keep a high volume of air inside the ambulance and uh, preferably separate the uh, patient and the driver uh, compartments, okay, and notify the receiving hospital that you're bringing in such a patient, okay. Similarly, when you transport a patient within the hospital, you have to use a medical mask on the patient 
avoid unnecessary uh, transport but again you have to use routes when you transport a patient from the icu to use a route which minimizes exposure to other staff and patients notify the area tell, tell the radiology i'm bringing in such a patient he may have a pandemic influenza strain so please be prepared right so these are some things which you need to definitely keep in mind i'm just going to run through these slides these are signages for when your isolation rooms for airborne precautions okay for droplet precautions and also for contact precautions i've given as to what are the important uh, you know pathogens which are included in each and what are the by just looking at these signages on the isolation room the healthcare worker will be able to identify as to what sort of ppe i should wear what precautions i should take okay this again is a summation of the isolation precautions uh, summary of isolation precautions for routine care excluding agp procedures okay whether it's bacterial ari or tb or any other para influenza para influenza or rsv which is droplet mediated transmission or any other influenza viruses right okay now the other important thing sorry ma'am i'm taking just another 2 minutes okay ma'am um, <laughs> so the other important thing is specimen collection and transport of uh, and handling of respiratory specimens within the hospital this is very often forgotten okay but there should be especially in urban areas when you don't have an outside area wherein they actually collect sputum uh, you know whether there's a good uh, natural ventilation you have to have something called as a sputum booth or a, or a respiratory collection booth these are the criteria for a respiratory uh, booth okay it should be a a transparent uh, booth booth with an exhaust okay of the air uh, exhausted air should be through a hipa okay uvgi will not work in this booth it should it's not advised also and after collection of every uh, patient sample you have to run the exhaust for at least 5 minutes before you take in another patient okay also whenever you transport any samples respiratory samples they should they should uh, the transport person should wear appropriate ppe the person who's collecting should wear the appropriate ppe what when i say appropriate ppe for respiratory samples it means n95 mask it means goggles or a face shield along with your routine full sleeve gown gown and gloves okay right so this is very important they should also be trained in handling spills and in handling the uh, samples because some of the housekeeping boys bring it they handle it manually they spill it they don't know what to do okay so they should be trained in handling or decontamination of spills and please do not use pneumatic tube systems for transporting samples many of the uh, newer hospitals have pneumatic chute systems by which they transport blood samples to the lab directly from the wards or icus this should not be done for respiratory samples okay and notify the lab when you are sending such samples so that the lab is also prepared to take adequate bsl2 or bsl3 level precautions okay this is a slide for healthcare worker uh, vaccination so please remember to vaccinate all the healthcare workers who are working in in areas uh, like you know in uh, who are caring for patients who have higher risk for influenza okay or uh, have a higher risk for severe uh, complicated influenza so they working in a geriatric uh, ward or they working in a neonatal ward or they working in a transplant unit and all those healthcare workers should have a receive an annual influenza vaccination as a pro protocol so please do that and exclude those who are having symptoms of ili from working in such high risk areas develop a surveillance system for these uh, for the your healthcare workers and keep a register of healthcare workers who have provided care for patients with ari so that you can do a contact tracing and see how many or where which are all the healthcare workers have come in contact with okay with that particular novel respiratory pathogen okay so check the temperature regularly and monitor for symptoms of ili in the healthcare workers this will help you to prevent fatalities morbidities as well as transmission of aris in your healthcare so this is the uh, last uh, slide basically there are some administrative control strategies for a healthcare facility as an as a person on the field yes we are these are all the practices and protocols which we will definitely do but as a person from the quality or from the as a person from the administration side at a higher level it is imperative that we have or strengthen our infection prevention control committee we monitor the compliance to these precautions at all times education should be a continuous dynamic uh, phenomenon okay ensure that you can't say you can't tell your pgs or your uh, therapists okay you have to do hand hygiene but there's no hand rub ma'am right so please ensure adequate supplies of hand rub adequate ppe is there okay and adequate cleaning and disinfection products are there okay also when in the in the middle of a pandemic situation it is very imperative that the healthcare facility as a system will have will should develop a way in which uh, the patients and visitors attention is triggered okay to certain specific symptoms in other patients okay so you can put sign posting at all entrances and you can increase surveillance 
guidelines. So that is the uh, last slide. So, so to summarize, the IPC practices and tools in healthcare and community basically involve or include early recognition, assessment, triaging, use of standard as well as transmission-based precautions, isolation, social distancing, quarantine, and educate, reinforce, and keep on monitoring compliance to education, right? Thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. I've run through a lot of slides. Uh, I hope, ma'am, it's fine. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you, Suvinya. Thank you so much. Thank you for so much for your patience. Nice presentation, Suvinya, because I wanted this to be done so that uh, in pulmonology practice, we have got so many queries, so many uh, people have so many queries. And yes, ma'am. Suvinya, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Our next presentation will be infection control pertaining to PFT by Dr. Aruna. I think, Suvinya, you can... Uh, Stop sharing. Yes, ma'am. I stopped, ma'am. Aruna, can you come on screen? Yes, madam. Yes, good morning. Good, good morning, morning ma'am. Dr. Aruna is actually a senior cons uh, pulmonologist. She has got more than 20 years of undergraduate and postgraduate teaching experiences. And she has participated as a reserve resource faculty, as speaker, and she has presented papers and she has won many awards. She is also a gold medalist in EMD. So over to Aruna. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for those nice words of introduction, madam. And uh, uh, in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, my topic is uh, about the infection control practices pertaining to opening up of pulmonary function services in this COVID or the post-COVID era. So as we all know, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had major health impacts globally in the sense that it has led to unprecedented infection control practices has led to shutting down of many OP or outpatient services with the availability of only emergency services in many hospitals. And uh, what we see is that globally across different countries are in different phases of the COVID-19 pandemic. While some countries have seen their peak, some have yet to see their peak, and a few countries are already in the post-pandemic phase. And of late, there is mounting uh, scientific evidence as to the resumption of and the reopening of pulmonary function testing services in hospitals. So in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes, as I said earlier, I will just be talking on what is the importance of resuming these pulmonary function services and what are the issues related to it? What are some of the modes of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus during a spirometry or a lung function testing? What are the different guidelines at the international national level for lung function testing? And which patients really need a PFT as compared to which patients uh, are, you know, absolutely or urgently need a PFT as to, you know, uh, patients who really can postpone their lung function testing presently? How do we ensure the safety of the healthcare workers and the patients also while doing a lung function testing? And the testing and equipment also, how do we clean, how do we maintain, how do we prevent cross-contamination between patients, and what are the ventilation considerations in a PFT or lung function testing room, and the environmental controls, and the future of lung function testing. So as we all know, there is an urgent need for reopening of pulmonary function services. And it is not only, and as we all know, lung function testing is very important, not only for the diagnosis, but also for the monitoring and the management of several respiratory and non-respiratory diseases also. However, there are important infection control issues which we have to face while dealing with reopening of pulmonary function services. We all know that while though we can examine patients in the OP or in the IP or in the emergency with a mask on, when the patient is doing a PFT or a spirometry, they cannot wear a mask. And also physical distancing between the person who's doing the test, that is a patient or the subject, and the technician who's with the patient of more than two feet or as guidelines recommended may not always be feasible. Patients invariably come in close contact with all the tubing, uh, the lab tubing, the equipment in the PFT room, and also the therapist. And also during PFT, there is a high amount of expiratory air maneuver, which is uh, generating a lot of expiratory airflow, especially the patient may cough during a maneuver or after completion of the spirometry or the lung function test, the patient may have an incessant bout of coughing. And this may lead to a potential generation of infectious aerosols. So th these are the issues which we face when we are going to reopen the pulmonary function services. 
Uh, as Dr. Sukanya has already elaborately uh, pointed out in the roots of transmission of uh, SARS-CoV and COVID-19 infection, I just want to just highlight the key difference in transmission between a droplet and airborne. So as we all know that during a PFT, so patients who come in, every patient who comes in should be considered as a potentially COVID su suspect. So that's very important. Any patient walking in or referred for a pulmonary function testing should be considered as a COVID suspect. So if the patient is symptomatic, of course, when he sneezes or coughs, droplets, which are more than five micron, can directly impact on the mucosal surfaces of the therapist, or it may fall down on the furniture or the tubing or the equipment of the lung function testing. Also, asymptomatic subjects of late, a lot of mounting evidence has come in from the WHO and other sources that even asymptomatic subjects of especially COVID suspects or COVID patients while talking or coughing can also transmit infection. So what we have to remember as uh, there's also see a lot of controversy whether PFT is an aerosol generating procedure because no guidelines specifically say, but we all know that while doing a spirometry, there, there is a respiratory airflow rates to the order of around 600 to 700 liter per minute, which may be even higher than a cough maneuver. And that will lead to production of infectious aerosols. So the transmission of uh, an infection, a respiratory infection, especially COVID, can happen either in the form of a droplet, either direct transmission onto the therapist, or it can be settled down on the surfaces, that is the tubing, surfaces, the tables, the side tables, etc., in the PFT room. And also, the infectious aerosols can linger on in the room for a longer period. And this can lead to cross-contamination when the next patient walks in for the PFT. So let's look at the sources of uh, cross-contamination, as I'd already told you. It could be direct contact as when the patient, when we reuse mouthpieces. Hence, it is always advisable to maximize the use of disposable consumables when we are doing a pulmonary function testing. So a direct transmission of infection can be through mouthpieces, can be through nose clips, which we use while doing spirometry, can be through the surface equipment, tubing, etc. Indirectly, when the aerosols are generated, this can linger on for some time and lead to indirect transmission through the form of aerosols. So when we refer a patient for lung function testing, it is always necessary to prioritize the tests which are going to uh, incur a higher risk for the patient and which are associated with lower risk for the patient. So the risk, the pulmonary function tests which need to be avoided in this situation are especially the metacholine, that challenge test and the exercise challenge test and the cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which is especially to be avoided because the guidelines, uh, which I'll enumerate subsequently, do not say these are very high risk procedures, which are preferred to be avoided in this current pandemic. However, procedures like routine spirometry and testing for static lung volumes, okay, like using a body box or a plethysmograph and the, for getting the static lung volume measurements, performing a DLCO and a six minute walk test are relatively safe. And these can be initially opened up and then later on the higher risk procedures can be considered. So what are the different guidelines which are um, of late coming up with a lot of evidence for resuming and reopening our pulmonary function services? So we have the American Thoracic Society guidelines for pulmonary function testing. We have the ERS, that is the European Respiratory Guidelines, which talk about the, all the components, what are the important specifications and the recommendations for lung function testing. We have the Association of Respiratory Therapists and Physiologists of UK recommendations for infection control measures in the, for lung function testing. We have Spanish guidelines and we have way north, the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines, way south, we have Australian, and we have, of course, the Chinese task force guidelines for pulmonary function testing. So all these guidelines, I want to say, that there is a beautiful article, which I have just put it up in the slide, known as the practical considerations for spirometry. And this particular article actually gives a summation of all these guidelines, sums up the recommendations and compares all the guidelines. So uh, because of lack of time, I've just put the, I've just highlighted the important recommendations from different guidelines. However, I advise all of you all to go through this literature review to you, for you to get an idea of the different recommendations globally for resuming pulmonary function services. So let's now look at the actual indications for uh, 
pulmonary function testing, especially in this era. Uh, for non-COVID, so I would like to separate it into indications for non-COVID and for COVID-19 patients. So for non-COVID patients, especially for the obstructive airway diseases like the COPD and bronchial asthma, all guidelines universally recommend postponing the use of spirometry and other, especially metacolin challenge testing. Or if it is absolutely necessary, we can monitor the progress of the disease by using a peak flow meter. However, there are certain essential or what we call as urgent indications which in uh, which the spirometry cannot be postponed. So these indications are especially when for cancer surgery, that is when we have a patient who is having a locally resectable disease and he needs a preoperative lung assessment for lung resection or lobectomy or segmentectomy, it is very, very essential to offer spirometry for these patients. So for cancer, pre-op assessment, when patients are posted for lung transplant, whether it be for ILD or for, for any other indication and for cardiac surgeries. Also, immunocompromised patients who require bone marrow transplants are one of the urgent essential indications for doing a pulmonary function test. Some guidelines like the Irish Thoracic Society and the Canadian guidelines also recommend um, spirometry for following up patients with ILD, cystic fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension, though it is not universally accepted. So let's now look at the, so we've looked at the non-COVID urgent indications for opening up or doing a spirometry. What about COVID-19? So as we all know, we thought we, all, we were all in the assumption that COVID-19 is a short respiratory illness and the patients recover it, get back home and go home and they don't have any sequel. But off late, there is mounting evidence to suggest that many of the COVID-19 patients, especially who are treated in the high dependency units, that is the ICUs or require high flow nasal oxygen, these are the patients, a subgroup of them eventually land up with residual lung fibrosis. And it is in this subgroup of patients who will require a regular monitoring of their physiological lung function parameters. And also pharmacology. There are a lot of developments for in pharmacology as regards the use of, use of steroids or antifibrotics. So lung function testing is indicated in this subset of COVID-19 patients. However, there is no testing recommended in COVID positive or any ILI or flu-like symptoms. And when a patient of COVID-19 is referred to us for lung function testing, it is recommended to do the testing only 30 days post-infection or 12 weeks after discharge and with a proof of two consecutive negative RT-PCR tests with body checks. And some recommendations also recommend doing uh, RT-PCR repeat 48 to 72 hours before the patient even goes in for a spirometry. Ideally, for such patients, it is better to have a dedicated separate PFT lab for such patients. The BTS and the ARTP guidelines also recommend that severe patients, that is severe COVID patients who have persistent radiological changes even 12 weeks after recovery, these are the patients ideally who might need a spirometry. So after running through the indications uh, for the eligible patients for spirometry, when patients are referred to the um, pulmonology department for a lung function testing. How do we ensure that the safety of healthcare workers and also the patients are ensured? Because non-COVID patients should not come in and go back with a hospital acquired or a nosocomial COVID infection. So we have to screen all patient referrals, as I earlier said, as potentially being a COVID suspect. We also have to prioritize the appointments. So suppose a patient who is immunocompromised, for example, a bone marrow transplant patient is referred for spirometry, we have to post him as a first case for spirometry so that he is uh, attended to first and he is not cross-contaminated patients. So we have to prioritize patients. And we can also, there is, uh, the, the ERS guidelines have also recommended a triage questionnaire which we can locally modify to the hospital convenience, where certain important points in the screening triage questionnaire can be given to every patient who is uh, sort of referred to for a pulmonary function test. There is a lot of reorganization also to be done because in the waiting areas earlier, we never used to separate the pulmonary function area from the admin or the OP areas. But now there is a lot of change that we have to think about when we reopen services. So at least there should be a minimum of two feet waiting distance between patients in the waiting areas. 
attenders should be strictly restricted ideally there should be no attenders but sometimes the patients are very old or they may be oxygen dependent wherein we they may need an attender to accompany them so attender restriction is very important because as previously said pointed out by dr sukanya even asymptomatic attenders can transmit infection and as i said there should be separate testing rooms for non covid and non covid patient indications and as regards the personal protective equipment all patients who are in the waiting area for the pft they have to wear the masks healthcare workers they have to wear because um, spirometry and other pulmonary function testing are potentially aerosol generating procedures definitely and hence n95 or ffp3 if ffp3 is not the minimum of ffp2 at least has to be worn gloves which have to be disposed between patients face shield or goggles is absolutely essential and an apron again which have to be disposed between patients hand hygiene is of course very important between patients and also healthcare workers have to follow the five steps of hand hygiene or moments of hand hygiene which has been previously elaborated coming to testing and equipment so as i said earlier we have to perform only one exam at a time we have to allow only one patient into the spirometry room or the pulmonary function testing area and one important or um, you know sort of a quick advice is if we can give a telemedicine instruction suppose a patient is already screened by us and he is posted for a spirometry we can consult by telemedicine and give some videos to the patient for the instruction and the technique explanation so that the technician need not spend much time in the spirometry room with the patient to explain the technique of the spirometry and have to minimize the exposure also where the patients are waiting in the waiting area for the spirometry appropriate audio visual aids and educational posters can be there so that the patients can be so where the technique of the pft or the spirometry is uh, rerun so that as a video or a audio visual aid so that the patients who are in the waiting room can sort of understand the technique and this again as i said decreases the time for the spirometry it's also very important that the in many usually what we do is we sit in the opposite direction or the machine is opposite to the patient and the technician so um, the technician in the current situation is preferably has to sit in the same direction as the patient and all disposables all consumables have to be disposable right from mouthpieces to nose clips and majority of the guidelines now recommend the use of the inline disposable the bacterial and viral filters with a more than 99% filtration efficiency for high uh, expiratory flow rates of 600 to 700 with a total uh, resistance being less than 1.5 cm so this is a recommendation for an inline disposable uh, bvf or a bacterial viral filter which has to be fitted before the um, um, sensor so the mouthpiece then the filter comes in and then only the other equipment on the tubing is attached to the spirometer we also have to remember that all equipment has to be recalibrated after decontamination so this is just a figure to show you that there is disposable mouth the clip nose clip the mouthpiece and this is the inline disposable filters some um, you know guidelines also recommend disposable sensors though this may not be uh, always available but one point i want to stress is we always have to go and see check with the manufacturing agency of the inline disposable filters because some of them actually may alter the function or the accuracy of the test which is performed so it is very important that the filter in place which is used does not cause increased resistance to the air flow and this should not lead to inaccurate spirometry results so please check with the manufacturer of the filter uh, and there uh, there has to be a statement that it will not alter the results of or accuracy of the test values which are being monitored so this is just to show you how when the you know technician sits across or just opposite the patient this is a wrong way so we have to sort of adapt our way and sit along with the patient to minimize the exposure to the aerosol transmission so connects coming to the ventilation consideration for infection control so as dr sukanya had said earlier a natural ventilation is the best um sort of strategy you can have with a minimum recommendation of 160 liter per second for each patient per hour however the natural ventilated rooms may not be always available and recirculation has to be avoided at any cost and clearance of aerosols in a room depend on the air change and the ventilation 
So as we know, an ad change or what we refer to as the ACH, ad change per hour, a single ad change or one ACH is estimated to remove approximately 63% of the airborne contaminants in the room. And PFTs or spirometry rooms ideally have to be negative pressure rooms with a minimum of 12 ACH and they can be fitted with a HEPA filtration system or UV germicity lamps. However, there is one caveat wherein the ERS guidelines, however, uh, recommend against the use of HEPA filters. This is surprising because their recommendation says, in fact, that HEPA filters may uh, promote a viral colonization. So this is a bit of a controversy, but majority of the guidelines say negative pressure rooms with 12 ACH and HEPA filtration. Next, coming to cleaning and disinfection of the equipment. So as I said, the sources of cross-contamination could be direct contact with equipment surfaces. So minimize all furniture in the PFT room. Don't keep unnecessary tables, chairs, furniture, etc. Anything hanging have to be removed because these are where the fomite transmission can occur. Always clean disinfect surfaces between every patient and consumables to be disposed after every use that is as a, whether it is a mouthpiece or a nose clip or an inline bacteriovirus filter. All equipments have to be cleaned twice and they have to be wiped down. So the surfaces have to be wiped down. And these are the recommended cleaning agents which are recommended by the guidelines, at least a minimum of 70% alcohol based or bleach, which is a recommendation of 0.2%. So please ensure that your cleaning agents are in concordance with the standards prescribed by the guidelines or 0.5% hydrogen peroxide. So these are the solutions to be used for cleaning down and wiping down surfaces and equipment. So it is very important to also know your machine because many of us really don't know about the machine. So we don't even know whether our spirometers, what type of spirometer we are dealing with. Are we dealing with, this is a rotating vein, are we dealing with a pneumotac or are we dealing with an ultrasonic spirometer? Because different spirometers have different cleaning and disinfection protocols. Some spirometers advise against using chlorine bleaches. Some spirometers say use only warm water, soap and soapy water. So it's very, very important to discuss with the manufacturer. If you have a doubt, you can even call in the uh, you know, the machine company people and ask them about recommendations on how to dismantle parts for cleaning and how to reassemble the parts cl after cleaning. Because it's very important that if you do not reassemble the parts after you've dismantled everything, you're going to get inaccurate results and the very purpose of doing a lung function is lost. Also, please remember to recalibrate the instrument after disinfection. So no ACs, though we are very comfortable. I know do, uh, the Gulf is very hot. Summer here and Chennai is warm, but please remember no air conditioning, no recirculation of air. And ideally, as Dr. Sukanya had pointed out, airborne isolation rooms with a minimum of 12 ACH is recommended. And a minimum of 30 minutes is enough actually to recommend or to reduce the contamination to less than 1% or an anti room with a 6 ACH for one hour. So, where there are many situations wherein you say, no, my hospital, I don't know what is the air change per hour. So I don't know how many air changes are there. So in situations where you are not very confident about the air changes, you give a minimum of three hours gap, close the door for one hour after the procedure and keep the open the windows uh, for 15 minutes and always keep the door closed. So if you're not sure about air changes, close the door, open the windows for 15 minutes and give a three hour gap between each patient procedure. So this is just a diagram to show you again, the difference between a negative and a positive pressure room. Where in a negative pressure room is, you don't want the air from the patient's room to enter outside. So it's always air is entering from the hallway into the patient's room as compared to a positive pressure room wherein the patient is clean and the air enters from the patient's room to the hallway. So this is a very, very important difference where you have to remember the difference between a positive and a negative pressure room. So coming to environmental management. So ideally, as I said, negative pressure rooms are preferred, but due to logistics management, organizational a negative pressure room may not be always provided. And HEPA filtration systems and UVGI lamps are also useful, except for ERS recommendations, which say against, which go against HEPA filtration. But one thing I want to say is just because a HEPA filter is fitted 
or you buy an expensive UVGI and fit it in your PFT room. It doesn't mean that you have to go, do, I mean, like uh, forget your basic hand hygiene protocols, basic standard infection control protocols, because this, all the, uh, the CPA filtration and UVGI may give a false sense of security that, okay, fine, all this is there, so it protects me. So that's not the way to take it. So basic uh, PPE, and hand hygiene is very, very essential. Ozone room decontamination has also been recommended by certain um, guidelines. The intervals or the frequency in which these cleaning has to be done base, is based on the local hospital infection control policy. So just to summarize the points, um, in the pre-COVID era, the standard infection control practices, which we were following for spirometry and lung function practices, however, unfortunately, are no longer sufficient. We have So when we are reopening our lung function PFT services now, we have to really build up on the standard infection control practices that's no more sufficient, and we have to go back and follow the recommendations. And based on the country in which you are, and based on the community prevalence of the COVID-19 in the country, countries can be in the pandemic, the post-peak pandemic, or the post-pandemic phase. And hence, the ERS guidelines level uh, actually recommend uh, three levels of um, safety recommendations for doing lung function testing, level one, two, and three, based on whether it is the country is in the pandemic phase, the post-peak, or the post-pandemic that has already crossed the phase, so the infection control measures may be a little lesser. So I again want to stress it, every patient is a potential COVID patient. So we have to uh, get a lot of support from the organization, the management and the administration for reorganizing the services in the pulmonary function. And not only that, we have to retrain our technicians and staff to adopt the new infection control practices for spirometry. And of course, the future for PFT, we have these home-based, uh, I mean, the spirometry, which, which can be done in the home, which is mobile-based apps, wherein the patient has a, the, his own spirometer. But however, these can be done only for certain specific parameters. We have the vitellograph, actually, which can be done in this way, wherein it's a very simple instrument. So these are things which can come in, and probably in the next two months, guidelines keep changing. So because COVID-19 is a dynamic process, open up our PFT services, we are going to get a lot of issues when we open up. So guidelines may change subsequently. So in a nutshell, I, uh, we are going to open up and PFT services will reopen, especially for essential indications and also for COVID-19 indications. Please remember PP, hand hygiene, standard infection control practices have to be followed in addition to negative pressure rooms and probably administrative support for reorganizing uh, organizing the whole PFT services. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aruna, for that excellent presentation. It was very clear. Actually, as you say, we cannot avoid doing this PFT in the COVID era. It is going to be near normal. But we should try to restrict the PFT to all those emergency indications, whatever you have told, like pre-operative assessment, then before for all those implant, lung transplant, etc. But yes. we should be very careful. We should not have a false sense of security of having some device or equipment where we, we all the patients should be considered as a, as a potential COVID patient and we should go ahead with the PFT. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you so much. Now I call upon Dr. Nabin, Nabin Benilaban for his speech on infection safe nebulization practices in COVID-19 era. Nabin is a young pulmonologist actually. He has graduated from Government Erode Medical College and he has done his PG from Vallabhai Ch Patel Chest Institute daily. And he has got many awards in national and international conferences and workshops. Over to you, Naveen. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I want to thank ma'am and uh, IR for uh, giving this opportunity. Uh, so we'll go into the session. Uh, safe nebulization practices during COVID-19. So nebulization is uh, one of the commonest procedure that is done in OPs, IPs, and in ICUs uh, in the field of respiratory medicine. But now, uh, during this pandemic, uh, we have a lot of questions uh, in our mind whether uh, about this nebulization, like uh, whether this nebulization will transmit virus, uh, is it safe to nebulize, or is there any alternative? And uh, if, suppose we are going to nebulize, then how to nebulize? Can nebulization done in home? And what are the precautions to be considered? And how to disinfect? So I think these are the questions that comes into our mind when uh, we plan for a nebulization for a patient. 
So by end of this session, uh, I will try my maximum best to clear these questions. So, so is there any risk of transmission during nebulization? Yeah, it's actually debatable. Uh, as per the CDC guidance, there are limited data on whether uh, the nebulization uh, really generates an infectious aerosols and it represents a transmission risk or not. Uh, according to the advisory committee of UK, they are advising the continuous use of nebulizers uh, because they are uh, telling that nebulization is not considered to be a significant risk factor. So there is a basic principle why they are telling this uh, is like uh, there are two types of aerosols. One is bioaerosol and another is meta aerosols. So the nebulizers are the ones that produces the meta aerosols. So the procedures like intubation or bronchoscopy, they produce the aerosols like bioaerosols. So the metaerosols are not infective, but the bioaerosols are infective. So these committees are advising that the nebulization is producing only a metaerosol and there is no bioaerosol. But at the same time, uh, when a patient is going to cough or sneeze during the nebulization, he is going to produce a bioaerosol that's going to be carried in the nebulizer chamber so that it contaminates the nebulizing unit. So when it happens, this generates a bioaerosol and metaerosol both. So there is a, it's still a debatable whether there is a risk of transmission, but still now we don't have any data of whether the nebulization is going to cause a infection or not. Uh, but since it's a corona family, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, 2002 outbreak, at that time they did a uh, cohort studies, but they found there is no significant risk of transmission to the healthcare practices for patients undergoing nebulizer treatment. So being a recent disease, uh, I think it takes more time on studies to know whether really corona, uh, COVID-19 is going to cause a uh, infection during nebulization. Okay, then uh, is really nebulization necessary, necessary during this pandemic? Uh, so avoiding unnecessary aerosol therapy is essential in patients with COVID-19 and pulmonary disease treated at home. So you just try to nebulize when there is an essential indication. It's not to be done like a regular time uh, nebulizing every patient uh, or uh, giving unnecessary aerosol therapy. So, if suppose, is def definitely only we need to use nebulizer or is there any alternative? Yeah, definitely is there, any, there is an alternative. If you are going to prescribe an aerosolized medications, it's always prefer inhalers over nebulizers because uh, inhalers with spaces are less aerosol mass generating pr procedure. Because when you use a jet nebulizer, you have lots of uh, aerosol gen uh, generating uh, things are there. But when you use an inhaler with spacer, there definitely it is less compared to the jet nebulizers. So then uh, you have a question that uh, you can have a question that why we should not use nebulizer in any patient. Yeah, you can use, but you should use in a patient when the patient cannot do a uh, specific breathing techniques for inhalers or the patient is in an ICU, uh, is in a sick condition where we, we can't use a MDI with a spacer, then you go for a nebulization. So nebulization is to be given only when there is an essential indication. Otherwise, it's always better you go for MDI with spacers. So these are some of the studies uh, which supports the use of MDI with spacer compared to the nebulizer. So uh, it, this study support that there is a less aerosol generating procedure is with MDI with spacer compared to the nebulizer. Okay, now we are uh, planning to give a nebulizer. So which nebulizer, nebulizer to be used? Whether I want to use a mesh nebulizer or I want to go for a jet nebulizer or I want to go for an ultrasonic nebulizer. So for that definitely uh, uh, it's, uh, the guidelines are recommending to use uh, mesh nebulizers and the ultrasonic ones because they again they generate a bis, very less aerosols compared to the jet nebulizers and also the timing the timing is very important because uh, when there is a lot more contact time then there is 
So these nebulizers actually gives very less timing. So definitely it is going to help you. So same way, it's always to use only single use nebulization units. It's, uh, it's better you don't go for a reusable one, but definitely it is not going to be possible in uh, most of the care centers. So if you are going to use a reusable jet nebulizers, it's better always use, you clean with soap and water, rinse and disinfect and air dry after each therapy. So as I would, uh, as the recommendation says, it's always you go for mesh nebulizers or ultrasonic one. Okay, uh, still you can have, uh, but I'm not having that much of uh, cost or uh, any issues. Then you can go for a jet nebulizer with breath actuated one. So what, how it's going to be helped? Definitely it is going to help because breath actuated inhalers produces the aerosols only at the time of inhalation and try to reduce and it doesn't do aerosolization during exhalation. So that the generation of bio aerosols are very, very less when you're going to use a breath actuated jet nebulizer. Okay, then we have a doubt whether uh, to use a mouthpiece or face mask, which I want to use during a nebulization. So whether it is a mouthpiece or a face mask. So there, there are studies done, uh, with, uh, you can see the table here, it shows when you use a filtered mouthpiece, uh, there is a very less aerosol generation during the procedure. So it's always recommended to use mouthpiece combination which reduces uh, exhaled aerosol concentrations compared with the face mask. Okay, so when it comes to filters, really is going to be useful yeah, the COPD Foundation has uh, recommended to use TARI filters that is much equivalent to an N95 mask with a nebulizer so that it filters the exhaled hair and thus limits the risk of virus spread. So you can see uh, the mouth, uh, near the mouthpiece an exhaled uh, filter with valves that is attached so that it helps to filter the uh, virus particles. So, but these parry filters are not available in much in India. So, so what to use? Uh, so there are different type of filters. There are simple viral bacterial filters that you use in PFTs. So that even that can be used. So apart from that, there are even available an EPA filter that is a breathing filter. So that it can be used. And uh, if your patient is going to be in uh, uh, ICU, so you. Uh, only the plain HME will not give a uh, filtration effect, but there are HME filters with viral uh, filtering capacity. You can use the, those filters. And this is a nebulization filter. Uh, there are two filters. Hello, Dr. Navin, can you hear me? Hello. Navin, can you hear us? Hello, Dr. Nabi is having some internet issues. He'll be back within a few minutes. Sorry for the disturbance.
okay navin you can go ahead okay sorry for the disturbance navin you can go ahead uh, sorry for the inconvenience uh, we'll just start the session okay uh, so there are different type of filters uh, like viral and bacterial filters and epa filters and hmv with viral filters and nebulizer filters so now uh, we come into the question to back to nebulize so we uh, there is uh, whether, whether to nebulize in hospital or we want to nebulize in home and back to nebulize and how to nebulize so if you are going to nebulize in hospital so you, it's preferably you perform the procedure in an airborne infection isolation rooms or negative pressure rooms with a minimum of 12 air changes per hour or at least 160 liters per patients in per second in patients in facilities with natural ventilation so and at the same time there should be less number of people inside the room and always it's better to maintain a adequate distance from the patient and you should clean the hands before and after treatment with soap and water or an alcohol based hand sanitizer is extremely important and same way you should always use to clean the surface areas after each procedure so if so uh, this is a airborne infection isolation room and if suppose there is no uh, airborne infection infection isolation room there are portable anti rooms are also there if but these make you some cost effective so it's better it will be uh, more cost producing so if you think of uh, nebulizing in a uh, primary care center then it's always use try to use the natural ventilation uh, a room with a good natural ventilation is enough for doing a nebulization procedure okay if suppose the patient is going to be in home or uh, the patient is a chronic patient you want to advise the nebulization in home then in home how to nebulize so if a patient is going to nebulize at home you advise the patient to get nebulized in an area where there is no air circulation so it is better you ask the patient to nebulize in a porch area or in a garage area so or like in a veranda or in a balcony where you will have a natural ventilation so you always advise them to nebulizations in natural ventilated places so same way as in hospital said you should limit the number of people in the room or the location where the nebulizer is used same way if suppose there is going to be is a caregiver for that uh, patient in a home so it's better or your uh, covid 19 is patient has been advised in a home isolation and is having a respiratory disorder so that you need to give some nebulizations then it's always advised full to the caregiver to you put a ppe even in home okay so what are the practical precautionary measures during covid 19 should be taken while nebulization so during pre nebulization it's always better to wash the hands ensure the device is clean and ensure protection for the healthcare worker if he is going to be in hospital situation or the caregiver if it is going to be a home situation so at the same time during nebulization it's always used mouth piece and a separate room for a uh, home uh, for the nebulizations and uh, post nebulization clean disinfect and the the nebulization at the same time the surface and areas of nebulization okay so the post nebulization uh, we always have a doubt so uh, if i'm going to use a, if a single usable then it's fine you can dispose it but if it is going to be a reusable jet nebulizer so then how i want to uh, how to disinfect that so when you uh, use a nebulizer for a patient then you after the use you just clean with a simple water then disinfect with 70% isopropanol or hydrogen peroxide for about 2 to 3 minutes and then just rinse with a sterile water and then air dry it should be dry, uh, done only with a air dry so this has to be done after every use for a particular patient so not only the nebulizer it is to be the area which is also should be to be cleaned so you can use any one of the agents with a particular contact period time so it's always you surface all the frequently touched surfaces uh, the dirty surfaces all should be cleaned with the 
corresponding disinfectants. Okay, to summarize, uh, these are the steps that to be followed when you are going to nebulize a patient. So avoid, the first thing you're getting to is avoid unnecessary aerosol drug delivery to patients with COVID-19. If you are going to de deliver an aerosol delivery, it's always better you use MDA with spaces if the patient is able to breathe the specific pattern. Okay, suppose if the patient is not going to uh, be producing the breathing pattern, it, then you go for the nebulizations. Then if you are going to consider using a nebulizer, it's always better you use a mouthpiece. And attach filters to the nebulizers before delivering the medications to the patients. And do not use face masks with nebulizers because it generates more aerosols. And it's always you use mouthpiece with, it can be a jet or mesh nebulizers. And the same way as I told, you attach the filters to the tubing jet nebulizer to prevent QVT emissions. And if it is going to be a mesh nebulizer, you add it to the mouthpiece. And administer aerosol therapy in negative pressure rooms. If you doesn't have a uh, uh, airborne infection isolation room or anti-room, you better do an aerosol therapy in a well-ventilated room. And if you are going to nebulize a COVID patient, known COVID patient, it's always better you use a full PPE equipment or you can wear if uh, an anti mask and gloves and goggles or face shield. So, and always maintain a distance of six feet from the patient. And it's, it is very advisable that you limit the number of people inside the room. And patients should be advised to use tissue papers while coughing or sneezing and to dispose of in a safety manner. So, as I told, the bioaerosols are mostly produced when the patient is going to cough or sneeze doing the nebulization procedure. So you advise the patient to have a tissue paper with him. And when he have that cough or sneeze, ask him to sneeze over the tissues. So and always uh, clean the hands before and after the treatment with soap and water. And clean the surfaces and nebulize the kits after every use according to the protocol. And once a procedure, if it is going to be a, a not it's a simple ventilated room, it's always better after a procedure for a patient, you keep vacant at least for 30 minutes with the well ventilation. So I think uh, I would have cleared all the doubts in this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navin, for the clean presentation. As you said, nebulization it should be avoided. Whether it is an aerosol generating procedure itself is doubtful. Some people say it's aerosol degenerating procedures. Others don't agree. But anyhow, instead of nebulization, if feasible, MDA is with the spacer will be ideal. But if you want to nebulize, I think you are given all the precautions. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Our next topic will be interventional pulmonology and safe ICU procedures. This will be presented by Dr. Fatima. Dr. Fatima graduated from PhD Institute of Medical Sciences. MB from, uh, she did her MBBS and diploma. She graduated from Madras Medical College and Dependi from Yashoda Medical College. She is a winner of Best Paper Award and Science Talent Award and so many awards in her packet, I think. I go to Fatima for the presentation. Thank you, ma'am, for the very brief and uh, nice introduction. Uh, so, moving on to the today's uh, last uh, topic of uh, today's webinar series. On the outset, I will I would like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for uh, inviting us and giving me an opportunity to present in this uh, present on uh, World Lung Day webinar series. So, without much time, today we will uh, talk about I will be talking about the intervention pulmonology and the ICU procedures. I hope most of the participants will be uh, working in an ICU setup and you will be having a lot of questions in mind about the ventilators, about the NIVs, about the nebulization techniques, uh, what are the PPEs which are, which are protective to you and uh, what are the precautions we, where you should take when you an intubate a patient or when you assist in a procedure like bronchoscopy, intubation, tracheostomy or central lines. So, uh, so my focus will be mainly on the uh, procedures and how to disinfect the equipments which are used in, a, in an intensive care unit. 
So, as you all know, the WHO has the, declared the uh, COVID-19, that is the SARS-CoV-2 as a pandemic. There was an in increase in the surge of uh, patients requiring an intensive care, uh, uh, getting admitted into an intensive care and requiring a very specialized airway management. And this has not, not only uh, lead to increase in the ICU uh, capacity, but also it has also uh, increase the risk of transmission of the virus to the healthcare providers. So initially it was found that around 3.7 percentage of the cases, laboratory confirmed cases in COVID-19 was among the uh, healthcare workers. And in the recent uh, WHO joint, China joint mission, they found that around 6.1 percent needed were uh, in a critical uh, stage according to the classification uh, we use and uh, around 13.8 percent were classified as uh, having a severe COVID-19. Uh, who required an intensive care unit uh, treatment. So uh, my focus will be mainly on uh, the uh, on the intensive care unit. So the factors which are mainly associated with in infection in such an environment are mainly uh, the occupational exposure, the device associated infection and improper terminal dis disinfection and aerosol infection. So these are the four main contributors of infection to the healthcare uh, providers in an intensive care. So as you all know that uh, COVID-19 is extremely transmissible, uh, leading every case leading into a two or more uh, secondary cases. And WHO has uh, recommended a lot of recommendation uh, with regards to the uh, PPE. Like, uh, like medical masks, goggles, gowns, fluid resistant uh, go uh, gowns and uh, specialized uh, for a specialized procedures like aerosol generating procedures, the recommendation is altered like use of an N95 or an FFP2 uh, equivalent respirator which I'll be dealing with uh, in the later slides and uh, they also recommend that the use of gowns or aprons it should be a fluid resistant. So there are a lot of recommendations given by WHO and CD C uh, CDC uh, regarding the PPE. So we will just uh, talk on each topic. So uh, first dealing with the occupational exposure, the most, the, as uh, I mean, the previous speakers, Dr. Suganya, ma'am, Dr. Venilevan, everybody has uh, stressed upon hand hygiene. So even in an ICU setup, though you are having a very uh, uh, full PPE for, uh, protective uh, equipment with you, it is important that you uh, have follow the hand hygiene not only when you are wearing a glove, it is also important uh, to do it when, uh, when you are removing the gloves and also uh, when you come in contact with a soiled or a contaminated area and also when you are touching any equipment in the uh, intensive care. So like uh, placing a thermometer to the patient or an esogastric tube, anything, any equipment before touching and after touching, you have to follow the hand hygiene practices. And uh, coming to the personal protective equipments, there are a lot of debate of which N95 is the best, which is the good to use. Can I use a surgical mask in an ICU or I have to use a respirator? Should I use a powered air purifier respirator? So there are a lot of debate and confusion going on. I have touched few uh, points uh, which may be important to uh, you all as a, as a healthcare uh, providers. So mask, they give, actually they are a loose fitting which cover only your nose and the mouth. They give you only a one way protection. And uh, it, is, uh, it is a false proof that we will be protected. Actually uh, speaking, there is, uh, there is no protection to the wearer. So it is mainly for the uh, use in a surgical uh, environment where you prevent you being infecting the uh, patient. So it is not designated, it doesn't have any uh, uh, filtration rate or an uh, designated uh, NIOSH or an uh, EN certified uh, mask. And it is not advisable to wear a mask in a uh, surgical mask in an ICU setup. Coming to a respiratory uh, respirators, there are these are usually tight fitting and uh, very uh, dis, uh, designed to create a facial seal. Therefore, there is no air leak above your nose and uh, over your mouth. And uh, there are valve and non-valve respirators. So non-valve respirators usually uh, give a two-way protection. That is, there is filtration of both the inflow and the outflow air. And this is the one which is recommended by WHO and CDC to be wear in a medical uh, environment or a healthcare setting. And there are available uh, N95 masks which you can be reused or it can be a disposable forms also available. 
so uh, as you all know that there is a global sh shortage of the medical masks and the respirated uh, respirators in the uh, in the covid-19 pandemic so the cdc has recommended for the extended or the re reuse of the n95 mask which i'll be dealing in my uh, next uh, few slides and every time the n95 mask if it testing has to be done it is not that you have done once and you don't repeat it when you use it for a second time because they have said that the facial contours may change so there it is a need that you every time you wear n95 mask mask you do a fifth testing and for a uh, resource limitation so uh, n95 no n95 may be uh, used as an alternative to other uh, um ppes like hepa filter so whenever you have a requirement you can use for a n95 or you can use for an alternative when available and uh, it has been found that most of the healthcare workers are very uh, uh, very attentive and very careful when they are donning the ppe but there is a substantial risk associated when there is doffing the ppe so it is also very important when you doff the ppe you the for you should follow the steps so it is very very important to avoid self contamination and it is also required to uh, keep on training yourself about the donning and doffing techniques and use of uh, paprs that is the powered air uh, purifier respirators it is usually uh, it is um, usually meant for healthcare workers who are associated with the high risk aerosol generating procedures like a bronchoscopy and into an uh, endotracheal intubation or uh, uh, going for a tracheostomy so i have shared a link below uh, you can go through this link which explains in detail about the doffing and donning technique with explanation and uh, detailed uh, in uh, detail every step so as you all know um, as i discussed previously there is a uh, shortage in the supply of n95 therefore you should always minimize and prioritize individual who are in need of n95 you should always minimize the number of healthcare workers in a setup uh, who are caring for a covid-19 uh, patients and use an alternative n95 respirators whenever feasible and you or can also go for an extended or a limited use of n95 so there are various type of respirators available the most commonly used as i said it is the n95 but you have also called as the elast elastomeric full face or a, a half face uh, disposable uh, respirators and a powered air purifier respirators which is the superior among all the uh, respirators so among the n95 uh, valve uh, there are valve and non valve uh, respirators available the, as i said uh, the non valve are the uh, uh, or the best to be used in a healthcare setting uh, as the uh, no, valve one give a one way protection that is it is protecting to the wearer but not to the uh, environment so they do not uh, filter the uh, wearer's expiratory uh, exhalation so not to be used in a healthcare settings so moving on what is the difference between the n95 versus the ffp3 or the ffp2 ffp stands for filtering phase piece or a filtering phase respirator so it is mainly uh, the manufacturer uh, the in niosh is the manufacturer the national institute for occupational safety and health which is under the uh, cdc program and the european which is which is the the mask will be labeled as en and the, the there is a standard used in all these uh, respirators so but while comparing the uh, uh, efficacy it is almost like the ffp2 and the ffp3 are equivalent to n99 and the n100 and the n95 is equal to ffp2 and ffp3 so it is always uh, better to use an n95 or an ffp2 or an ffp3 respirator while working in an intensive care so this is just a depiction of what i have explained now so the protection is almost around 94% uh, in n9 900 in n100 and ffp3 it is around 99.9 so this there are other forms also available uh, other manufacturers are also are available now as i said the earlier there is a as there is a lack uh, lack of uh, n95 mask the cdc has recommended an uh, extensive use extended use and a limited use what stand for m95 mask for a longer period of time uh, uh, when you come in encounter with the uh, several patients that is you don't uh, don and doff the respirator in between the patients so it is mainly suited for uh, uh, patients when you are de dealing in a ward or in a hospital uh, setting so there you can uh, use an uh, extended uh, use of uh, n95 mask 
So reuse, reuse is that in between the encounters. That is uh, when encountering multiple patients, you can don and off the respirator. So, but when you don the respirator, it is most important that you safely, uh, uh, um, uh, safely place the uh, uh, respirator. As Madam has said in the previous uh, uh, seminars, that uh, the five-day period. Okay, so in uh, the storage of the N95 mask should be sufficient enough. to state that it has been decontaminated so uh, limit in turn it can be called as a limited use so when you doff and don the respirator in between uh, the patients so the preferred method is usually a uh, um, extended use when compared to the limited use as there is a less risk of contact contact transmission in extended use and extended use the number of hours that can be used it's not dependent is not determined by the uh, length of the hours you use but it is determined by the hygienic procedures which you carry out when you are uh, using it for a longer period that is the how many breaks you take how many times your uh, n95 mask is getting decontaminated is, is getting contaminated sorry and uh, how many uh, times you use it in a restroom or a meal break oh, fatima sorry please sir yes ma'am 10 minutes more ma'am okay ah yes ma'am fine thank you so uh, cdc also recommend the extended use of n95 uh, rather than a limited use of uh, n95 mask so whenever you use for an extended period you should make sure that your n95 mask the surface is not contaminated use a face shield so that you avoid uh, uh, contamination as a barrier then you should always keep on reminding the training staff and the uh, uh, staff healthcare providers in the icu about the posters and uh, through posters and also n95 mask should be discarded when you have been used it in a aerosol generating procedure or it has been contaminated with a nasal or a respiratory uh, um, secretion or a blood or a body fluid so always you have to uh, use a face shield as i said earlier and perform hand hygiene though you have using an n95 mask it is whenever you touch your respirator you have you are supposed to do a hand hygiene uh, hand hygiene precaution and the recommendation for a you reuse it is there is no way that uh, can determine that this number of times you can uh, reuse your uh, respirator but certain manufacturer states that it can be reused us for uh, five times four times or three times but the maximum recommendation is uh, is for about five times but you make sure that your respirator is hand uh, in a in a designated storage area in a breathable container uh, between the uses that is you don it and you keep it very safely and you should avoid touching the respirator whenever you reuse a respirator you should avoid touching the respirator and you should always use your glove while wearing because initially when you use it for a first time you don't use your glove while wearing an n95 respirator but when you reuse it for a second time or a third time it is recommended that you wear a uh, pair of sterile gloves before wearing your uh, reused uh, n95 respirator so what are the risk of uh, associated with this reuse of uh, respirators it is mainly self contamination and the respirator may be may not be contaminated only with the covid 19 but it also be contaminated with other pathogens and uh, in a study it has been found that uh, more than one third they failed a fit test when it is reused it is and more it is more common with the double mask Uh, which uh, accounted for about 71% compared to the uh, doom shaped mask uh, in 95 respirator which accounted for about 29 28% and uh, one study has uh, shown that that there is average per shift the number of times they touch the respirator is around 25 times so each time you be in a in a in an intensive care uh, uh you have to uh, be uh, very sure that you don't touch the respirator and the uh, decontamination of the respirator it is mainly recommended only for the niosh approved uh, ffp uh, ffrs and uh, decontamination uh, as recommended by the niosh is by the ultraviolet germination germ germicidal irradiation moist heat and the hydrogen uh, peroxide and decontamination doesn't mean that it, uh, it you can increase the number of hours you can use the ffr and uh, what are the risk uh, with using the respirator a poorly fitting respirator may not uh, give uh, adequate protection and uh, avoid touching the respirator and you should uh, as a false sense of protection you should not have a false sense of protection and you should take uh, necessary precautions even when you are wearing an uh, respirator so these are the uh, recommended ppes depending upon the procedure which you undergo in an intensive care unit 
or in a, outside the ICU also, a low risk procedure in a COVID-19 suspect and a high risk procedure in a COVID-19 confirmed cases. So whenever you use in a suspected or a confirmed case, everything has to be discarded. There is no, uh, uh, there is no question of using it as a reusable except for the PAPR. Whereas in a low risk procedure, you can restore the, uh, um, uh, the, the mask because you will be using a surgical mask. You have to discard the mask. And in a high risk aerosol, aerosolization procedure in a COVID-19 suspect who is not a confirmed case, you can go for a limited use of a PAPR and a um, N95 respirator after uh, adequately decontaminating it. So coming, moving on to the devices and the aerosol associated, there is a classification which have been uh, used uh, to classify the uh, instruments we use or the equipment you, we use in ICU, mainly the critical uh, care equipments. It has been classified into critical, semi-critical and the non-critical. So we will be dealing with all, uh, all sorts of uh, equipments in the uh, intensive care unit. So the methods of uh, disinfection which have been recommended are the heat and the chemical. So heat uh, for heat resistant is mainly uh, equipment which can withstand a high temperature. If a washer or a pasteurizer is not uh, available, use a high-end uh, commercial dishwasher and uh, uh, dishwasher which can sanitize with a feature that it can reach up to a 70 degrees centigrade. And chemical disinfectant is mainly for the plastic equipments uh, which cannot withstand the uh, uh, heat uh, resistant method of uh, disinfection. And the uh, it should be a high level disinfection using a glutral dehyde based formulation of about 2% or a stabilized hydrogen peroxide with 6% and uh, a parasitic acid uh, variable concentration but usually it is less than 1% is sporicidal, it is considered to be sporicidal. Sodium uh, hypochlorite uh, solution with uh, 1000 ppm available chlorine and uh, appropriate chemical uh, germicide that is mainly selected on the object to be disinfected, the, its composition and the intended, intended use and the level of disinfection uh, needed and the scope of the services available in the healthcare facility. So these are the uh, steps of uh, disinfecting the equipments. These are the steps. So whoever is involved in the cleaning of the equipments should wear a PPV throughout the procedure. It is not that we just wear an N95 mask and clean all the equipments. You have to make sure that you wear your goggles, your gown, your face shield, your N95 respirator, your gloves, everything when uh, while dealing with the uh, cleaning of the equipments. So it has to be initially washed with the liquid soap and then it has to be rinsed with a clean water or a sterile water. If sterile water is not available, you can use a uh, tap water, but provided there is a filter uh, for, through which the water passes through before uh, cleansing the, uh, before cleaning the equipment. And uh, you have to follow it by an uh, alcohol rinse and you have to uh, do a force drying. Force drying, if it is not available, you can place it uh, after rinsing it with clean water on a clean towel or a cloth and you have to uh, store the equipment in a closed, uh, in a closed packages. So these are the steps involved in cleaning the uh, instrument which we use in intensive care unit. And ventilators. These are the most important uh, uh, important thing in an intensive care. So there is a very highest risk procedure for a droplet uh, infection. And it has been stated that the handling and disinfection, if it is not done properly, it is usually associated uh, with uh, a lot of transmission of the uh, virus and uh, also a major source of uh, the accessories. The ventilator associated accessories are associated with a, as a um, major source of contamination. So how to clean a mechanic? ventilator right it is recommended that you clean it for every after and every uh, uh, patient so first you have to wipe down the uh, controls and the entire outside the uh, outside of the equipment with a compatible disinfectant which is a sodium hypochlorite ma, yes ma'am ma, yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma uh, uh, so then uh, you have to disinfect it, all the tubings you have to make sure that the entire tubing is flushed with the uh, uh, disinfectant and it is not necessarily uh, uh, important to clean the uh, inside the tubings of the inside ventilator because you will be using a bacterial or a viral filter in the inspiratory and the expiratory limbs. So the expiratory limb has to be cleaned in very properly and you have to use bacterial and viral filters 
uh, especially in the exhalation valves. Even if not in an inhalation, in an exhalation valve, you have to use it. And nebulizations, uh, as, uh, as we have seen in the previous uh, topic, that it has to be avoided to the maximum in an uh, intensive care unit. And whenever you are supposed to do a nebulization, nebulization it has to be done in an AI room. And a number of person has to be uh, uh, to be avoided, and it has been uh, recommended that uh, not uh, you have to you should not enter the room for about two to three hours after the nebulization has been administered. And uh, how to nebulize in a ventilated patient? So this is a T piece. So they recommended that this is the usual method we use. So the nebulizer is usually connected to the uh, uh, inspiratory limb of the uh, ventilator circuit. And uh, the yes, so just a second, sorry. And uh, they recommended that the T piece should be uh, connected to a one-way valve. So one-way valve, which makes sure that the entry, the air enters, the nebulization or the uh, aerosol enters into the um, uh, enters into the uh, patient circuit, um, into the ventilator circuit, and not uh, outside the ventilator circuit. So the recommendation is you uh, attach the T piece and the nebulization port between the HIMA filter and the patient instead of connecting it to the uh, ventilatory circuits. So NAV uh, is also, uh, we are using it uh, in intensive care. So NAV, it has been suggested that when you use it in a very high flow rates of about uh, uh, 60 or 70, and uh, CPAP, when it is delivered at a very high pressure of about 20 centimeters, there is a lot of aerosol generation. So the recommendation is to use a very flow rate, low flow rate of about 20 liters. And also it has been suggested that whenever you are subjecting a patient to HFNC or a HFNC, you place a surgical mask or an uh, N95 mask over the H HFNC. And uh, these are the uh, recommendations. So. See, in an ambu bag, you can uh, connect a mechanical filter and a peep, uh, and a peep valve mainly to uh, provide a, uh, adequate pre-oxygenation. And whenever you are using an inspiratory, the, there should be a HMI filter connected to the inspiratory and the expiratory uh, limb of the ventilatory circuit. And when you use a single uh, circuit uh, NIV, you can uh, mm, uh, you have to attach the filters, mechanical filters. And uh, the other recommendation, when you have uh, both, uh, you can use both the HEPA filters and the HMI and the HME filters. The, the HEPA filter to be connected to the uh, 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 inlet of the air and to the expiratory uh, limb. It is a wide piece uh, shaped uh, circuit used here. So you can uh, place the uh, HEPA filter to the expiratory uh, limb and to the uh, air, air inlet. So I will skip this slide as the, we have discussed previously. So these are the aerosol generating procedure. And coming to the intensive care, uh, mainly uh, you should have, as I already discussed, it should be a tertiary class protect, protection for all uh, healthcare workers and it all should be a disposable form. And uh, a special attention has to be placed uh, mainly because of the uh, side of the exposure to the eyes and the gloves uh, getting slippage and exposing your wrist. And uh, you should always use a uh, removable disposable cover shoes and hand hygiene has to be fo followed in each and every step. Uh, the, the main targets in an ICU is the space, the staff, the supply and the standards. So ICU setting, it should be an isolated room with all the equipment provided with the medication and the environmental disinfections. And uh, the uh, main, uh, main thing in the ICU setting is you have to segregate the place. So, and the, dis the disinfection has to be a concomitant and a terminal disinfection. So, which will be done uh, as we have uh, discussed in the previous detail about the uh, terminal disinfection. That is, you have to disinfect the bed, the linen, the table, the chairs, everything uh, after the, uh, as a part of a terminal disinfection. Ma'am, just five more minutes, ma'am. I will be uh, completing. Ma, please go rush through, ma. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, as you all know, intubation. So, intubation, uh, intubation. It should be a rapid sequence in intubation, and uh, you should be intubated within uh, 60 seconds. And the uh, intubator or the operator should be a specialized person, and he should be wearing a PAPR, which is with the uh, level three biosafety. And whenever feasible, use a disposable laryngoscope or uh, everything which, if feasible, use a disposable equipment. I'll just skip to three slides because of the lack of time. 
So all the staff has to be uh, segregated into a frontline teams and they should be uh, provided a repeated uh, training uh, about the infection control measures. Just showing the uh, uh, isolation of the isolated ICU, the staff being trained. Uh, a drill has to be conducted so that they can act quickly and there should be a designated pathway for the shift of patients from the ICU to the other ICU or ICU to other wards and also they should be wearing a PAPR whenever uh, feasible. So these are the recommendations for the intubate uh, for a patient uh, when you are uh, intubating. It is all it is just a repetition of the same what I have discussed. Okay. So apart from all this, it is also necessary to uh, use the surface discontamination like your mobile phones and the proper disposal of a wear, uh, soiled uh, object and you should limit the number of persons entering into the IC. And uh, last about uh, the bronchoscopy. So deep shed, uh, it is recommended only in patients who have an artificial airway and it is not recommended in a spontane spontaneously breathing patient in this COVID-19 era. And it has been uh, advised to go for a deep sedation and the artificial airway should be connected to a three-way. It, it should be a closed airway suction and should avoid cross-contamination of the bronchoscope. And bronchoscope is a semi-critical device as it enters into the mucous membrane and it has to be wiped and the channel has to be flushed with water. And it is very important that after the procedure, you have to do a leak test. If the leak test has failed, then it is not uh, uh, advisable to subject the bronchoscope for an enzymatic cleaner. So if the leak test is cleared, then it has to be subjected to a high level disinfection or a gas sterilization. So the pre-cleaning, uh, then leak the procedure, the steps are pre-cleaning, the leak testing, the manual cleaning, and the visual in inspection followed by disinfection, which can be either done manually or using an uh, automated endoscope reprocessor. So even in bronchoscope, it is advised to use a single-use bronchoscope as it avoids uh, contamination, avoids reprocessing, and uh, requires a very limited uh, setup uh, for the procedure to be done. But limitation is it is not available widely. And uh, it is not only the bronchoscope which has to be decontaminated, but also, the, also the, all the instruments and the equipment which have been uh, taken uh, during the procedure. So this is just a picture of the single-use uh, bronchoscope. It is, a, it is a disposable one. So the uh, last slide. So the take-home message is just follow the hand hygiene, full PPE, wearable, feasible, use an extended or limited use of PPE, minimize the aerosol generating procedure, always prefer for a negative pressure isolation room, uh, carry out the heat chemical disinfectant for the uh, respiratory equipments and whenever feasible use a HEPA or an HMI filters, bacterial and viral filters and disposable instrument if feasible. Thank you for Thank you. Ma. Thank you, ma'am. And we have a few questions from the audience. Yes, ma'am. This may be for Sudhanya, Dr. Sudhanya. Dr. Sudhanya, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, oh, tell me, ma'am. We can answer. Two questions are there, ma'am. One is... Can yes. you tell us the current recommendation for respiratory equipment, disinfection and cleaning, laryngoscope blade, handle, reusable lambu pad, ventilator, expiratory cassette, cleaning of ventilator monitor? Yeah, I think many of them have been already uh, touched upon by the previous yeah, people. Uh, of course, uh, I would like to just touch upon the laryngoscope blades and the uh, handle as well as the ambu pad. Uh, okay. So uh, basically, this is a little debatable issue because uh, laryngoscope blades need to be actually checked uh, on a regular basis for the bulbs. Okay. So even if we sterilize or do a HLD uh, after use, there are two things which are uh, recommended, two methods. One is uh, you can sterilize the blades, uh, you can autoclave them uh, or ETO them because the bulb is there. So you, you can actually ETO them and you can keep them in a uh, sterile uh, pouch. But... Uh, the issue is when they need to check for the bulb of the blades, then again, they're reopened. So the, the thing is that you need to uh, just put them as sterilized, but you, you can just put them in a Ziploc cover after you do a HLD with either the 2% neutral DI or ETOE. And uh, you can just put, after that, take it out, examine the bulb, and then we, uh, when you handle after sterilization, you need to clean your hands and then handle, check for the bulb put it in a clean Ziploc cover and label it as clean, not sterile. So that if, uh, you know, it is not uh, regarded as a, uh, you know, sterilized uh, equipment. So that is one thing. Okay, ma, one more question, ma, for you. Yes, ma'am. Somebody, some Shantanu Kilkarni has asked, 
ஜெர்மிசைடல் இஃபெக்ட் so that is one thing uh, otherwise in all the isolation rooms as well as in uh, negative pressure rooms and all the humidity should be ma- uh, you, ma- uh, you know maintained to around 40 to 60% that is what is but actually there is no specific requirement for a dehumidification in any room if it but can be maintained with the existing ahu and the yeah. air changes per hour it is well and fine yeah because in the covid era actually they say high humidity maybe it will help with low low or high humidity so you have to keep the humidity in between especially for colder climates maybe oh. that is the question that she has asked okay and ma'am then one more question is how frequently should we clean the machine in a day that is your already answered ma yes <laughs> ma'am thank you thank you so much ma thank you thank you ma'am online then a few questions for dr fatima yes ma'am dr fatima are you ready yeah yes ma'am Just a minute, ma. Yeah. One yes. question is regarding nebulization during ventilator patient for maintaining closed system. Which is the best one, either aerojet nebulization or jet nebulization? Ma'am, actually, the the recommendation is not to use a nebulizer in an uh, intensive care unit. Whenever feasible, we have to go for an MDI. But uh, the recommendation about the nebulizer is to go for a jet nebulizer because uh, what they suggest is that using a jet nebulizer not only helps in uh, delivering the drug but also it helps in the uh, secretions involved uh, uh, secretions. So it uh, it also helps in the dislodgement of the secretions from the airway. So jet nebulizer is recommended uh, compared to the aerojet uh, nebulization. Uh, jet nebulizer, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much, Fatima. Then one more question for you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question is how long should a single respiratory rehabilitation intervention on a mechanical ventilated patient in intensive care unit last? I think maybe they are talking about the physiotherapy. Okay, ma'am. Uh, uh, actually, uh, chest physiotherapy. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, the chest physiotherapy is also considered as a aerosol generating uh, procedure in the ICU. So it has to be uh, taken care in a very similar way. uh like we use for other aerosol generating procedures so the, the it is not that it, it should not be given but um, most probably it has to be avoided but whenever we are supposed to give a because most of the patient may have a secondary bacterial infection leading to a lot of uh, secretions and need a, a regular uh, drainage of the secretions so we can go for a chest physiotherapy but adequate precautions uh, right from hand hygiene to the full pp is taken care so it should be treated as a aerosol generating procedure Okay, one more question for you only. In a ventilated yes, patient, using inline or other conventional methods of nebulization, which has better aerosol deposition? I didn't get the question, ma'am. Okay, in a ventilated patient, yes, using ma'am. inline or other conventional methods of nebulization, which has better aerosol deposition? It is inline only, ma'am. It is inline has a uh, it, it is recommended and it has a better uh, aerosol deposition. And as I have uh, discussed in mine. there is a lot of changes in the uh, tps and the nebulization uh, uh, port which has been connected to the uh, ventilator circuit and the one way well has to be used so that the expiration uh, doesn't uh, the expiratory uh, um, air doesn't enter into the environment it should be one one well and it has to be uh, confirmed with the leak leak testing okay. thank you fatima i think there yes, are some other questions which are not pertaining to our topic so okay ma'am questions for want of time then we have come to the conclusion of the session ma so thank you very much for the kind attention actually hope this would have thrown some light on your uh, doubts on uh, and clarifications for the infection control program ma i thank all the speakers and i also thank the organizers for giving us an opportunity to do the same finally whatever said and then you will have to bear in mind four point four things maybe a take home message first thing will be physical separation then respirator and hand hygiene environmental controls and personal protection personal protection is the best one ma thank you so much
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all.